Like you, I've been watching the elaborate preparations that the government's been making for the Independence Day celebrations, spending hundreds of millions of rupees on an extravagant display of power. Apparently, without a care in the world, that poverty has reduced many children in this country to just a single meal a day. I've been thinking, if I were the president, how would I address the nation on this occasion? Well, here goes. My fellow citizens, today we celebrate 75 years of independence. For 350 years from the death of the last king of Korte, Dom Joel Dhammapala in 1597, and until February 1948, we were colonized by foreign powers. There are nationalists amongst us who often say that colonialism is the reason for our country's predicament. I remain to be convinced of that. There is no doubt, no doubt at all, that Sri Lanka was once a great nation, a great civilization. Until the end of the Polo Naru period about 800 years ago, Sri Lanka was a small but prosperous country, a powerhouse of agriculture, architecture, engineering, innovation, and additionally blessed with a culture that was deeply rooted in Buddhist tradition. We were the Singapore of South Asia back then. But then our civilization collapsed. This is no great shame. After all, great civilizations must one day decline. Just look at the Greek, the Roman and the Islamic civilizations, for example. By the time the Portuguese took over, our island was fragmented into four warring kingdoms. It was a right royal mess. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Pork Strait, India had reached the apex of its flourishing. By 1600, India was producing 22.5% of global GDP, despite a minute population by today's standards, and compared with just 9% of global GDP today. There's almost no evidence of a similar flourishing in Sri Lanka at that time. When the colonials got here, we were at our weakest, our most vulnerable. We were ripe for the picking. So it's about time we stopped harping on about what a great and noble past we used to have. It doesn't matter anymore. We need to live in the present. There are some people who argue that colonialism was a good thing. I disagree. Like slavery, colonialism is always bad. But we have to face the fact that by the end of the colonial period, by 1948, Ceylon was the most prosperous country in Asia, definitely in South Asia. We had a thriving export-orientated economy. We had a manageable population of just 7 million people. We had a superb infrastructure of roads, railways, ports, and airports. We had a 16-year history of universal franchise of democracy, an independent judiciary, an excellent civil service, a secular constitution, free education, and even a positive balance of payments. Britain actually owed us money back then. But we had our weaknesses too. An unsustainable rate of population growth, population has tripled in the past 75 years. And there was also a lack of industrialization. Our political leaders, our early prime ministers, were drawn from the highest echelons of society. They came from affluent families and had excellent educational backgrounds. After all, four of the first five attended St. Thomas's College, which was my old school as well. All of them had since 1931 been groomed for leadership by the British through the mechanism of the State Council. And then in 1948, they finally got their hands on power. The absolute power that comes with sovereignty. And all of them at least in my opinion, were absolute abject failures. And it took them just 10 years, a single decade, in which to reduce it all to rubble. From the very outset, political parties had to outbid each other in order to get votes. If you didn't offer a generous welfare package, free education, free health, free rice, free electricity, free stuff, 
And all this spiced with a pinch of anti-Tamil bigotry and class warfare, you simply couldn't get elected. People also demanded to work less and less, 21 paid holidays every year, 84 days of maternity leave, more than 25 paid public holidays. In short, lots of free stuff and as little actual work as could possibly be managed. And once you got that free education, the government had to even create a free job for you in the state sector and pay you a pensionable salary to retain your political loyalty. Every election was reduced to an auction, an auction of votes. And the votes went to whichever party made the highest bid. And to give you more stuff, diao diao, us poor politicians had no alternative but to borrow more. Where else is the money to come from? As a result, there has been no year in the past 40 years in which government debt has been less than 70% of GDP. Right now, it's well over 100% of GDP. We borrow more than we produce. In fact, I think the last time in our history that we had a primary fiscal surplus was in 1955, the year I was born, 67 years ago. Few indicators say it better than the exchange rate. In 1948, the cost of a US dollar was just three rupees and 32 cents. Today, as you know, it's more than 370 rupees, a devaluation of, listen carefully, 11,000%. We politicians learned very early on that when it comes to subsidies, to giving you free stuff, we can't mess with you. We can't mess with the electorate. We learned that even though we are stupid and ignorant, you are even more stupid and ignorant. The inability of the UNP government to continue the wartime rice subsidy in 1952, for example, precipitated the great Hartal, evicting Dalgi Senanayake from the prime minister's job and bringing the government to its knees. Anxious to get back into favor with the electorate, in February 1956, Dudley's successor, Sir John, promised to make Singhala the sole official language. SWRD Bandarnaik followed suit, and for his bad luck, the poor chap won the election that year. The Official Language Act was signed into law just three months later. It was very simple. Here's what it says. The Sinhala language shall be the one official language of Ceylon. This effectively disenfranchised both the Tamils and the Burghers. And by 1958, just 10 years after independence, race riots had reduced the country to ashes. The burghers were quick to pack their bags and emigrate to Australia. Even John Kothalhavala, the father of the UNP's Singhala-only policy, jumped on a plane and took up residence in England. The man simply had no shame. And now you've gone and named a university in his honour. What were you thinking? The Tamils struggled on for another quarter century and then they too ran away to just about any country that would have them. Canada, Switzerland, Australia, England, the United States. Now, finally, even the Sinhalese are running away to those very same countries to join their Tamil brethren by the plane load every day. Meanwhile, from the 1950s onwards, we nationalized everything. We nationalized these things so that we could take these jobs from the private sector and give them to you in the state sector. We nationalized transport, schools, hospitals, newspapers, banks, hotels, plantations, petroleum, shipping, insurance. We nationalized the lot. And when there was nothing left to nationalize, we created new monopolies, state corporations, unprofitable as they were, to compete with the private sector and in effect to destroy it. We did these things because it was the only way we politicians could give you those jobs that you wanted, the jobs you felt entitled to in the state sector. 
And of course, as chairman and directors of these so-called state-owned enterprises, we appointed our unemployable relatives and our political cronies. And now you blame us because these so-called enterprises are unprofitable and draining money from the economy. They're inefficient. But how can you blame us? It's after all what you wanted. How else can we give you those jobs? And now, if we try to privatize any of these, you get all hot and bothered and start protesting. You cut off our legs at the knees. And then you ask us to run a marathon and become Singapore. You've got to be kidding, right? But of course, it hasn't been all bad. Your life expectancy, for example, has increased by 30 years since independence. Just about every household in Sri Lanka is now connected to the national grid, the electricity grid. We've got rid of most of our diseases, the diseases that made your grandparents' lives a misery. Rice production has increased from just 1.8 tons per hectare at independence to 4.5 tons per hectare by 2015 making us a net exporter of rice for the first time in 500 years. And then, of course, Gotabe Rajapaksa came along and destroyed it all. Perhaps most importantly, we've retained a semblance of democracy, the ability to change governments peacefully. You must give us credit, at least for that. But what is the value of free health care when almost half our children are undernourished? What value does free education have when a quarter of all students fail their O-levels and more than a third fail their A-levels? And almost no one can pass without expensive private tuition anyway. And that's just the ones who stay on in school. According to UNICEF, almost 60%, 60% of our children drop out of school by the age of 17, before they are A-levels. And what is the value of democracy when the vast majority of those whom you elect to office are thugs, crooks, and morons? Now, 75 years after independence, all you can do is patriotically sing the praises of Mother Lanka for her ruling landscapes, her lofty hills, and her misty valleys. That's all we have left to crow about. Having started at the top of the Asian rankings in 1948, we've been overtaken by one country after another. Of course you can curse us politicians for the mess in which the country finds itself, but when it comes to looking for whom to blame, isn't it time that you looked in the mirror? Maybe you need to point the finger also at yourself. Sri Lanka's predicament is not the fault of its politicians alone. It is also your fault. For once in your life, learn to take some damned responsibility. Are you born? Well, that's what I would say if I had to address the country as president. People often ask me, how come you're not involved in politics? Well, now you know the answer to that one. Until next time, thank you. <laughs>